Thanks everyone. Thank you for the opportunity for uh, letting me talk here today. Just very quickly, I just wanted to say uh, a big thank you to everyone who's organized this event. Uh, as Matt was saying, enormous amount of um, work goes into putting something like this together. And so I, I, I sort of deeply appreciate it. Uh, and also, you know, I, I was very lucky yesterday. I managed to get a quick look through some of the other presentations that are happening over the next few days. Amazing, amazing work. So like when you hear a little bit more about me and my sort of history and stuff, for me to be able to see all of these things happening now, I'm blown away. And so I, I just think it's a fantastic time uh, in the industry. And I just want to thank all of you and all of the contributions that you're making. So um, I'm Jeremy Doig. Uh, I worked at Google from 2004 till about 2022, primarily in video technologies, uh, uh, starting off on the server side, server infrastructure content understanding uh, through the launch of uh, Google Video as a product, the YouTube acquisition, and then later on on Chrome on the client side, um, the implementation of the video tag and all of the codec protocol and container work that went along with that, and then subsequently WebRTC and the, the VR technologies that, that came on after that. Uh, prior to that, at Microsoft uh, for about nine years, uh, pretty much from sort of 94, 95, from the start of uh, the internet and the, the internetization of a lot of the products at Microsoft. And before that, I worked uh, for a spin out from the BBC interactive television unit uh, called Multimedia Corporation doing interactive CD-ROM. So I've been working in video technology online and offline for pretty much uh, my whole career. Um, whilst at Google, Chrome, uh, you know, deployment of the, the video codec, um, uh, you know, that was, that was the, the main focus of this talk. And it's pretty much about, you know, how do you bring sort of the legacy video ecosystem that was already up and running and had a lot of traditional approaches and business models around it uh, to the web, which was sort of quite different in lots of ways. Um, this, of course, is, is work that spans many people, many projects, many teams, many companies over many years. This is my perspective. This is my, my view on it. Uh, I'm sure many of you will have you know, slightly different views of it. That's absolutely fine. Happy to talk about it afterwards. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to talk about patents, um, which should make you happy. Um, and um, let's get on with it. So the first thing I thought I'd do is, of course, you know, every day, every, uh, every speech has to have a, uh, uh, a Gen AI uh, uh, image in it. So I thought I'd try and make a movie poster for today's talk. But in retrospect, you know, when I take a look at this, it wasn't really a conflict between the video, the legacy video industry and the web. It was really more about how to sort of bring these things together a little bit. So much as I, I, I like the image, it's kind of nice and high quality. I don't think it tr truly represents what it is I'm trying to, to get across. Um, it really is more a sort of a path to alignment of, of the industries. Uh, so to understand the, the uh, what I call sort of the legacy of the TV broadcast industry a little bit, don't worry, I'm not going to sort of force march you through, through the whole thing. Um, I have to, of course, mention uh, Maybridge, you know, the original motion JPEG, I guess, uh, the, the, the galloping horse thing, primarily because it was filmed just down the road uh, at uh, a racetrack in Palo Alto uh, a long, long time ago. And then, of course, all the phenomenal work that happened in the um, uh, analog TV industry uh, with TVs, satellite, uh, tape recordings. And really, it's in, in around the 1990s, I think, that things start to get interesting for the stuff that, that we're interested in, which is the creation of uh, digitized media assets uh, that can be distributed, at that time at least anyway, on, on CD-ROMs. Um, uh, in terms of standardization at that point, you've got the EBU, the ITU, and MPEG all starting to come up with defining the formats and the, uh, the codecs that are being used for those distribution channels. But of course, the internet isn't a big deal back then, and so most of the focus is really going on those other distribution channels. Uh, with uh, the early 90s, we now start to see the major operating systems. Of course, cell phones you know, didn't even exist in any meaningful way uh, back then. So it's all sort of desktop. Uh, QuickTime and Windows Media uh, came out. They all you know, were primarily for consumption on, on those uh, environments. But you know, they launched with different codecs. They were incompatible. You had to learn one system versus the other system because it was a representation, essentially, of the uh, operating system wars that were sort of uh, profound at, at that point point in time. And remember, this is all long before Windows 95. None of this stuff was easy to set up. Custom hardware, custom external boards, weird configurations and things. It was a very, very specialized uh, sort of time. Um, one of the things I, I don't think that gets uh, enough credit is, is See You See Me, uh, the video conferencing product that was uh, launched from Cornell um, based on uh, 261 uh, for single 
basic rate ISDN lines, 64 kilobit, if you can imagine something that small. Um, uh, it was, was sort of prescient in its time, I think, a really, a really cool thing. Not necessarily the very first video conferencing software, but, but um, uh, a really good one. Uh, and then uh, Intel, uh, not on the slide, uh, Indio, I think, was probably one of the first codecs that actually worked on multiple platforms. And because uh, it came from Intel and they're pretty good at processors, uh, all ran in software. So Indio, I think, was, was actually quite a sort of a, an important step forward. And then, of course, everything changed, the web. Uh, uh, NCSA Mosaic, not the very first web browser, but probably one of the most famous. Um, uh, you know, a document viewing mechanism, uh, not even remotely useful for video or media or any of those things. The web is for documents and video was something else. And that was sort of how people felt about it at the time. Um, and now things start to get a little bit more interesting. Um, you've got the web, which is for, for documents, but you know, how was media going to be transmitted online? Uh, Netshow uh, from Microsoft, which eventually turned into Windows Media Services. Uh, Real Networks added video support in 97, but they actually had audio products that launched, I think, three years before that. Um, and then Apple with uh, QuickTime streaming services, uh, which they sort of uh, fairly rapidly uh, turned into uh, Darwin, the open source Darwin server after that. They decided not, not to compete in that market. And so we have, again, you know, compete, competing incompatible systems, different products, different protocols, um, still mostly leveraging, I think, 261 and 263 as codecs underneath. But the, the approach that had been taken in the market at that time was a reflection of, of the business uh, uh, dynamics, which was that it was all about who was going to dominate, who was going to win, who was going to own that thing, and everyone had their own products and they were head to head. Um, something else that gets left out here a little bit uh, as well often is uh, Web TV. Uh, um, Microsoft acquired Web TV in 97, and um, you know, when you think about what the origin of the video tag is, Web TV actually had, and the reason why um, no one sort of ever really talks about this is because it was in Windows 98 as an additional installed component, and so therefore almost no one saw it. They actually had a thing called TVML that you could install where you could embed broadcast TV directly inside of a web page. So you could, you could have broadcast TV you know, straight in your web page, which I thought was pretty awesome, but no one saw it because it was so weird, and also required specialized uh, TV decoder cards to be installed in, uh, in your machine. But um, if you ask me, you know, the origin of the video tag, I think it, it actually goes, you know, sort of quite, quite far back. Um, now, the good news is, uh, here comes open source. Uh, you know, the, the folks at Videolan and, and all of the folks who've been working uh, on, on those products for a long time, you know, came together with VLC, which for me was, was absolutely a sort of a really, really important point. Because, you know, sick and tired of having all of these different sort of walled gardens of different protocols and different approaches, you know, a single multi-protocol, multi-codec application that could talk to all of these different things and was both a client and a server. And so, I mean, what a fantastic universal translator, you know, to, to this, this complicated world. Um, of course, this was not the first time uh, that, you know, the work of, of, you know, these very talented people uh, was around. I think any of you, and I'm sure most of you in this audience, you know, who run sort of uh, good-sized streaming systems, we all know M Encoder and FFmpeg and GStreamer and LibAV Codec and all of these things. They've been around for years and are absolutely fundamental uh, to the success of video online. And so, you know, I can't reiterate enough just how important open source is to our industry as a whole. Um, then, of course, Flash. Flash changed everything. Um, now, uh, Flash added video in 2003. Flash, of course, FutureWave Splash, which turned into Macromedia Shockwave, which turned into uh, Flash, uh, was prevalent on the web at that time. You know, like almost every website you went to had the little install Flash thing. And Flash, before the video implementation, was mostly for animated buttons and menus and little things that made those boring, drab, gray web pages just a little bit more interesting. Everybody wanted Flash on their, on their sites, and so pretty much everyone implemented some sort of uh, Flash-related uh, techniques on their web pages. And so when Flash added video to that, now they just suddenly became the default uh, video distribution system uh, on the web almost overnight. Um, sort of an interesting anecdote around that time is 
So when I joined uh, Google in 2004, one of the first engineering projects they asked you to do to sort of get up to speed on the systems is to implement PageRank yourself. PageRank being uh, the mechanism by which you essentially count the number of links that point to an individual web page, and then you sort of stack rank them. And because so many websites uh, used Flash, the, the site that, at least when I joined Google, that had the highest page rank was the install Flash site. There was nothing higher than it, which was, um, not the intent, but it was very, very interesting. Anyway, um, so then uh, in, uh, we have Skype uh, adding video calling. Skype before then was, was just voice calling. They used VP6 in 2005. And then you know, Microsoft coming a little late to the party and trying to sort of compete a bit more with, with Flash with Silverlight. Enormous investment from Microsoft to try and push those technologies. And actually, there was some good stuff in there, mostly deriving from smooth streaming and all the cool stuff that they'd learned along the way. But it was too late. Flash was already pretty much dominant. So, um, you know, what if I think about, okay, well, what is the state of the market at that point? We have, you know, all this proliferation of different internet products, but they're still largely using TV standards, like the, the protocols, sorry, the, the formats and the codecs that came from that. And, you know, that was probably a prudent decision at the time. These were not bad technologies. It seemed like a reasonable choice. But, you know, that, that simple set of what seemingly obvious decisions turned into sort of problematic things a little bit later. And so when sort of thinking of a metaphor for this, I'm like, wow, you know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. But um, when you're standing on the shoulders of giants, um, if, you, if you have an opinion about how the direction should change, you really don't have much say in the matter. Um, and it's a long way down if you want to get off. So um, there, is, there is a two-edged sword there. Anyway, that's my tacky metaphor. Um, and so when we think about how web video was actually going to work, not just web video on the internet, but web video, there were some decisions there that needed to be changed. There was some important work that needed to be done. So when I think about where the standards organizations were at that point, um, I, you know, it made me certainly a, a little bit nervous that some of the things that I was worried about. First of all, you know, looking at um, uh, you know, the, the web companies, internet companies, certainly very active in IETF, W3C, Watwig, and other sorts of things like that, but not really so pr sort of uh, visible in, you know, MPEG and SMPT and, and those sorts of organizations. Certainly, I think Apple, Microsoft, and Adobe were, but that was primarily because they already had businesses and products that were in that sort of offline domain. Um, and so, sort of joining an organization that is primarily dominated by organizations that are not you know, aligned with yourself in terms of what the goals are is, is, is quite sort of disconcerting and problematic. The next one is, is a big one for me, which is um, when you're sending stuff to televisions, televisions are easy, right? Everyone's got exactly the same resolution, the same bit rate, the same format, they get all the same bits at exactly the right time. Those design constraints are really, really, really different from what we have to deal with, which is these crazy proliferation of different endpoints. They're have all sorts of different processing power and capabilities. They can be updated all the time. They don't necessarily have hardware dependencies. The networks between them, every single person gets their own individual channel, which can behave completely differently. The design constraints, like if you went to an engineer and you said, okay, here's system A and here's system B, you design a system for it, it would be hard pressed to say, oh, the same technology will work perfectly in both scenarios. And so, you know, sort of being locked into that sort of television mentality of how to approach this problem, I, I certainly thought of that as, as problematic. We also weren't taking advantage of these sophisticated endpoints that we have. We were just sort of treating them as like, oh, I just send you frames of video and you render it and that's your job done. What a shame. Like, what a, what a waste of, of, of capability on the endpoints. Rapid iteration uh, is also something that is, that is absolutely critical. I was talking to some folks earlier about this. Um, because bandwidth is so expensive on the internet, or it's certainly sort of a dominant part of, of, of the costs of, of distributing video online, and we hear a lot about that in the press today, is um, if you can create a codec that is even 10% better or something than a previous one, you should really consider whether you know, that's worth deploying. Uh, in a broadcast TV world, the idea of changing a codec is monstrous. You've got to change all your hardware and your broadcasting stuff. There are satellites up there that have hardwired dependencies on previous codecs. It's a, a very, very different philosophy about how you approach iterated uh, codec development. And so thinking about, okay, is, you know, we need a standards body that is more attuned to the needs of the internet. Um, uh, you know, that, that sort of mindset wasn't really there. 
Um, because most TV endpoints are pretty much hardware, adding more complexity uh, isn't as painful as it is as in the software world. Um, so, and, and the, I think there's a talk about this a bit later on about you know the increased complexity of next generation codecs and things like that. Complexity is something that you know is, should really be pushed back hard against. It really has to justify uh, the bit rate savings uh, that it gets. And then finally, the technologies that we use on the internet have to be used for real-time encoding and also uh, on demand. And so anything that you push out has to be implementable in software um, for encode and decode. And so when I think about, well, okay, these are some of the sorts of things that I would consider to be paramount for an organization that was creating technologies for this domain, they weren't really there in, in these, these other systems. Uh, there's a bunch of others as well, but these are the, these are the main ones that spring to mind. So, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of this in detail, but to me, this is, this is sort of like the, the subset of some of the important uh, dates uh, and things that happened in the evolution of, of bringing uh, video to the internet. Um, one thing I call out is that uh, Flash's adoption of codecs, you can see in uh, 2003, uh, they launched with 263 Sorensen and then added VP6 a couple of years later and then 264 main concept, you know, a couple of years after that. So Flash, this is Flash actually showing us what I just said in the previous slide, which is there is this absolute appetite for moving to higher quality and lower bandwidth codecs as fast as reasonably possible. And I think Adobe actually did a pretty good job of that. Now, two years is, is kind of brave. Um, I think when it comes to actually developing a codec, you know, it, you, it probably takes longer than that. And I was talking to someone else earlier about this, uh, about, you know, what, what should that time frame really be? Uh, you know, if I ruled the world, I would be pushing for as fast as possible. But, you know, the harsh realities of things make things a little bit longer. But certainly 10 years is not okay. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, you've got Flash essentially sort of dominating what video is on the web for a good five years or so. And the web, main web browsers, you know, more and more are starting to get interested in like, okay, we need to launch HTML5, audio and video native support within the web browser are unnecessary. Uh, how are we going to do that? And there's, you know, this really awkward, painful decision you need to make, which is, are we going to launch the browsers with a requirement for royalty bearing technologies built in? That's essentially what it comes down to, because that isn't true for anything else on the web. And so now are these video people going to come in and just sort of like change that entire philosophy? Well, people felt very, very strongly about that. And so, uh, but that couldn't get in the way of the launch of, uh, of the video tag. And, you know, VP3 was already out there and, and VP3, uh, if you remember, so in 1999, Onto required, uh, acquired MetaVisual, which created the VP3 uh, codec and was open sourced uh, briefly uh, shortly thereafter. Um, that was supported inside of the browsers. But honestly, um, it wasn't competitive with 264. You know, it was cool that it worked and it, and it was free and uh, open. But in order to get people to switch to a different technology stack, you've got to be better. You can't just go in and say, well, here's something that's not quite as good, but at least it's free. That's just not going to, going to swing it for, for most people. And so um, that was the challenge. You know, could we find something that was competitive with 264 uh, in time to try and make the launch of, a, of the video tag? And so that was, that was quite a challenge. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time doing evaluations and, and things at that time, and I came across on two. Um, now, on two, you know, actually in retrospect, it was sort of an obvious choice, right? They had experience with Flash, AOL, Skype, Tencent, QQ, Java. You know, the technology was broadly used in a, a, broad, a whole number of uh, different products around the world. Um, optimized implementations on x86 and ARM and other platforms, chipset implementations, uh, tooling, server-side, cloud-based, all of that stuff, they, they you know, had already done that and had good experience in it. We also knew that WebRTC was just around the corner as well. So having people who really knew about how to do real-time video conferencing and rate control and all of the other fun stuff that comes along with that was really important. So on two was the one. And now the clock starts ticking because uh, there's the race to co close the acquisition, to implement all of the, the stuff in the Chrome browser with the video tag and audio and all of the rest of the subsystems that need to make that work well, and to open source VP8, turn it into WebM, audio codecs, containers, and everything else that goes with that. 
But it's worse than that because Onto was a public company and it was the first public company that Google had ever acquired. And so you cannot behave in a way that you assume that the acquisition is going to successfully close. So we had to be completely hands off from the entire process until you know, legal had signed the deal and it was all completely closed. And then we could actually start working on the integration. So that really made the, the timing very tight. Um, but the good news is uh, in May of 2010 at Google I.O., just down the road here actually, um, uh, Chrome was on stage with, with uh, Mozilla and Opera. Chrome was not the first with the video tag implementations. There were, there were other sort of dev mod, uh, modes and things like that, that that supported it. But, you know, we released the WebM project with VP8 um, and we got it up and running and it was launched. And that was sort of was a, a pretty important uh, milestone. But really the hard work was just starting at that point. <clears throat> um, if you look back at the history of web browsers and the different formats that they support, um, there have always been uh, active discussions, let's say, around which formats to support and the pros and cons and consequences and who has their favorite ones and things like that. And of course, there's always sort of assertions of uh, uh, you know, liability and other sorts of things that get mixed into those conversations. And so actually, even as far back as, as the original you know, HTML definition, there were times when, you know, Microsoft proposed that doc, Word doc files should be the default file format for the web. Uh, you know, that was, that was actually proposed. Adobe thought PDF files should be it. So, you know, when I, when I think about, oh, you know, should I get completely freaked out about the fact that people are arguing about the codec and container that much? Not really. These things have been, you know, it, it's irksome, but you know, these sorts of things have been around for a while. So on the image side, of course, there have been sort of you know, assertions and allegations. And so, again, I said I'm not going to get into, into patents so much, but um, I think that um, stabilizing and coming to a small number of formats that people are agreed with, it just takes time and you have to work through the, through the process and work with all the other browser manufacturers. Um, but the adoption of the video tag was slow. It, it frankly, it was really slow uh, after the launch. Well, why was that? Well, because there wasn't really a viable codec that was competitive with the best that Flash had to offer at the time. And um, because there was sort of inconsistent implementations across the different browsers, you know, this, this was sort of problematic. And so even though VP8 was, let's say, comparable with 264 in terms of, of what it offered in terms of quality per bit at the time, it wasn't good enough. Right? You've got to be much better to earn someone's business because the hassle of retranscoding your archive or you know, creating all of the code to do the if statement swaps around which format to serve under, you know, which circumstances, it's a pain in the ass. Right? So you know, you've got to really, really earn people's business. Um, so VP9 started. Uh, the goal of VP9 was to basically make it 50% uh, more bit rate, um, more bit rate savings than, than VP8. Uh, now VP9 launched in mid 2013, and the adoption for that was a whole lot better than it was uh, for VP8. And slowly we started to see uh, video tag adoption uh, get better after that. And of course, uh, I, I have to mention, because Colleen got a mention earlier, uh, Colleen uh, managed to squeeze some references to uh, VP9 and uh, WebRTC into Silicon Valley. So thanks, Colleen. Um, all right. But there's one more step, even after to VP9 and then sort of AV1 after that, which is essentially based on VP10, um, it's not enough to just say, okay, here's a bunch of technology, we're going to make it open. Like you have to truly be open. You have to be able to put the power into the hands of the broader ecosystem. And so the AOM was launched in 2015. And um, it was sort of a, a weird time, you know, sort of like, <laughs> Uh, so putting it out there and, you know, letting other people like truly sort of take control and, and participate and evolve it. But, you know, I think it's going extremely well. If you look at AV1 and the work that's happening in AV2, um, I think this, you know, this is, is working out pretty well. Uh, certainly the, the names uh, in this list are far more representative of what I had hoped to see uh, in the very early days. There's far more web companies on there, far more internet companies, people who are actually, con you know, really concerned about bandwidth. Uh, and I think that's really good. And then I was really, I don't know, I was conflicted about whether I should put this quote in here because it seems so snarky and, and that wasn't my intent at all. I actually didn't even know that this had been said. Um, but, you know, as I was, I was researching around, I, I, I saw this quote from, from Leonardo, who is the, the chair of the MPEG group, um, which essentially just sort of 
encapsulates everything that I've just said in the last 20 minutes <laughs> down to a single sentence. But um, it's nice, at least anyway, to know that you know, like this, this one doesn't have to be a fight, right? These are sort of things coming together, and we didn't manage to find that path through it then, but we we found another way through it, and so I just sort of add it for completeness. Um, so, you know, what do we learn? I think, uh, you know, people who have tried to control things and constrain them and, and, you know, do that sort of just have not lasted on the internet. Maybe people have had temporary success, but it, it never really lasts very long. Uh, the open source community, fundamentally and critically important. Not a cool side project to mess around with, but something that is the substrate of so much that happens in this industry. Uh, rapid iteration and reducing costs, absolutely paramount. We must never forget uh, that. And then free and open, awesome, absolutely. You know, you don't even get to the party without those requirements, but they're not enough on their own. You've got to be better. And so it's tough, but you know, it can be done. Um, and so finally, just in case anyone was thinking, oh, we're done, you know, happy ending, uh, off we go. I, I think we're far from it. Um, you know, this is where I start to upset a few people in the audience. So I, I'm not doing it on purpose. This is just kind of person I am, if you know me. Um, this is just a subset of my whiny list of things that, that I think we, we should still do, but, but it's, it's fun to talk about. Um, it's so weird to me that most streaming systems still now are essentially pre-transcoding a set of fixed bandwidth, and then we just hop backwards and forwards between them. Um, being truly dynamic and actually using all of the available bandwidth to the best possible capability at any instant surely should be the goal. We're still taking these old TV philosophies and we're crowbarring them into the requirements that we need for our network. And I know about layering and I know about WebRTC and I know about all these other things, but it's not in the fundamental design. So when I think about the codec, can the coding be done in a way that allows you to truly dynamically modify the amount of um, bandwidth that you're using, even on a per frame basis? Um, why not? Um, Working in the compressed domain, there is so much I see in, in video pipelines today where people will take uh, frames, decode them, work on them, recode them, send them back. I'm so surprised that we don't do more in the compressed domain. It's totally possible. Object recognition, scene recognition, shot detection, all these sorts of things. Uh, these can be done, and I'm optimistic that uh, certainly with machine learning techniques, uh, we can do a lot more tra training on uh, stuff in the compressed domain. Uh, manifests as well, um, bizarre that, that I think we still use, you know, text files that tell us how to concatenate chunks of, of, of MPEG blobs together. Um, uh, I get it. It's, it's complicated. It certainly has become, you know, a life of its own and, and there's a lot of complexity in there, but it does seem like a rather um, straightforward way. Uh, of approaching a problem that is that is quite complex. And so I really look forward to manifestless uh, approaches or things that are far more dynamic and require more from the server side uh, in terms of the communication with the client to make the, the streams optimal. Uh, this is a fun one. Three frames is all you need. Um, why is starting video so slow? It drives me nuts when you click play and you have to wait sometimes several seconds to see something. It, it's inexcusable. Um, as long as your good put is better than the encoded bit rate, which it generally is in most, in most situations, you should only need three frames. You know, so I'll give you a 100 milliseconds budget, right, max. It should be less than that, but let's start off with 100 milliseconds is all you should need to be able to start playback on a client. And I know there's lots of other things. Go and talk to the ad server. Go and talk to see if you're allowed to watch this video, blah, blah, blah. But still, you know, the video should start much, much faster than this. So uh, I'm looking forward actually to seeing the Kyber talk, which hopefully we'll, we'll get into this a little bit. Um, your code is smaller than a keyframe. Well, kind of. But the, the point here is, is that we're sending gigabytes of data over the network, and yet the thing that we worry about, the codec itself, is tiny, tiny, tiny by comparison. Just give everyone a codec with the video, right? And then you can have your own personalized codec. You optimize for your device for whatever at that time. Um, now embedding executable code inside of a media payload might be a very, very bad idea from a security perspective. Um, but my point is that we're very precious about this tiny little codec blob, which is minuscule compared to everything else that we're serving. And so we don't take advantage of that, and maybe we should. Um, I'm very interested in um, 
uh, volumetric content and volumetric storytelling. And so when I look at the formats and the way that the industry is moving towards how to deliver volumetric experiences incrementally, like streaming volumetric, um, I, you know, I'm disappointed that we're not making more headroom in that space. And I'm, it also seems worrying to me that we seem to be falling back on using, oh, well, this is the thing that worked in 2D, so we'll just sort of tweak it a little bit and make it work in 3D. I don't think like that at all. I think that's sort of dangerous. Um, I think DRM as we think of it today is, uh, I'm out of time. Uh, <laughs> DRM, you know, is based on this, this fundamental principle that it is copy protection. Copy protection is just silly, as we all know. Um, I think appropriate compensation really is the way we should think of it. So as long as a client is well behaved and understands the monetization principles of what it is that it's displaying and can do that, you can completely separate the distribution of the bits from the monetization. That will create a ton of new opportunities and businesses on the client side, you can get much more versatile with, uh, with what you do on the client side. The, the way we think of DRM absolutely needs to, to be, uh, have a root canal. And then finally, 65% of the world today has access to the internet, which is amazing. Like, I can't believe that it's as much as 65%. What that means is there's still, you know, at least two and a half billion people out there on the internet who don't, well, two and a half people who are not on the internet. And how are we going to deliver media experiences to these people? What are the things that are really important? And I know, you know, we're not responsible for deploying the, the networks necessary or the satellites or whatever it is. But the technologies that we create have to work really well in that long tail of edge cases. And so we should never lose sight of the fact that, you know, you want more users? There's two and a half billion sitting there right now. And uh, that would be good. So finally, parting thoughts, please contribute to open source. It's not just like a cool thing. It is actually fundamentally critically important to everything that happens in this industry. Emerging markets are important. And I know these are tough times in the industry, but if you can, if you're an employer, create more opportunities for junior people to come into the organization and contribute. This is a great time. There's a lot of really, really awesome people out there who are looking for work. And that's it. Thank you.